We're back in our roundtable today. Our all experts in the dark and arcane world of economic reporting, Aaron Barnett from uh, CNBC, Steve Leisman from CNBC, and Stephen Perlstein uh, from the Washington Post. Stephen Perlstein and Stephen Leisman both have won Pulitzers for their writing in this area. Aaron, let's begin with you. I know that you've been talking to a lot of people on the Hill. Are they going to get this done this week? They say yes, talking to, to various uh, members of leadership, both in the House and Senate yesterday. They're going to get it done by Friday, Tom. Right now, what we have is a very rudimentary plan, and there's a lot of argument, especially among Democrats. Hank Paulson, as you know, wants to have as much flexibility as he can for the money he needs to get this job done. Democrats would like to put in some, maybe a stimulus package of $100 billion. Some are fighting for that, and some are also fighting to say, look, banks, if you participate, we want to put a limit on CEO compensation. So that's a big part of it. But, uh, Tom, the big question is, last time we went through this, it took six months from the day we signed legislation to the day the RTC was up and running. And some might argue this time we do not have that window of time. It needs to happen much more quickly than that. Steve Leisman, you wrote a lot about the RTC, which bailed out the savings and loan industry. It was $150 billion. It was chump change compared to what we're playing with here. Yeah, uh, what we're talking about in terms of layout by the government is they're saying they're going to $700 billion. What's interesting is they are going to buy and sell this stuff. So ultimately, we may end up having owned and or sold trillions of dollars worth of mortgages. There's one upside, though. In this case, Tom, it doesn't appear as if the government is actually going to own real estate. They're going to own the packages or complicated derivatives that own the real estate at the end. The government last time was selling real estate. It was setting up auctions and stuff like that. This time they have to sell security. So it will be a little easier. And to Aaron's point about setting up shop, I think that's going to be easier, too. What we're hearing, Tom, is they're going to and this is pro probably politically controversial, they're going to engage Wall Street to solve Wall Street mess. They're going to, they're going to be taking portfolio managers and give them what we hear, $50 billion portfolios, and say, you run it on behalf of the government. The number of conflict of interest stories that Stephen and I and Aaron are going to be talking about in the next several months is going to keep us in business for a Doesn't while. Doesn't Warren Buffett have a good idea in naming somebody like Mike Bloomberg to be the czar of this kind of an agency and creating a separate entity altogether? Um, the trouble with the separate entity is it goes against what Aaron was talking about was the idea of speed. If you use existing infrastructure and then go and create, use portfolio managers, look, in the, in the RTC, the people they hired were the S and L guys who ran the banks to the ground because they knew where the bodies were buried and how to exhume them. Uh, Steve Perlstein, let me share yeah. with our audience uh, something that you had to say in the Washington Post this week in your analysis of what's going on. What we are witnessing may be the greatest destruction of financial wealth the world has ever seen. Paper losses measured in the trillions of dollars. Corporate wealth, oil wealth, real estate wealth, bank wealth, private equity wealth, hedge fund wealth, pension wealth. It's a painful reminder that when you strip away all the complexity and the trappings from that magnificent new global infrastructure, finance is still a confidence game. And once the confidence game goes, there's no telling when the selling will stop. Is anyone going to be held responsible for this truly? Well, a lot of people have already been held responsible because they lost all that wealth. So uh, that's one thing. But a number of them walked out with a lot of money as well. Yeah, some of them walked out with a lot of money. You know, a lot of people focus on that, Tom, that these, some executives walked away with a lot of money. The amount of money we're talking about is in the hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars. Those people walked away with millions, and we get outraged about that. But let's, we, we, at this period of time, we need to keep our, our eyes focused on the big thing, which is that the whole system is melting down. And you want to focus on that and not that some guys got away with but money Steve, couldn't, you, couldn't you see subpoenas and uh, cases where bankers are called before Congress or even a jury and said, you had this on your books, but it was really worth that. And you can yeah. see that kind of process playing out. You can, but, you know, to criminalize this stuff, it's, uh, we've got a problem to solve. Let's, let's solve the problem. You let's think we should be it. moving on, not looking back? Yeah, I mean, at some point, you know, if there was real fraud, well, let's go and get that. But someone who made the wrong decision, or who, who uh, signed the wrong value to something on his balance sheet, when everyone else was doing the same thing, and, you know, it might have been but reasonable. What did they know, and when did they know it, yeah. when it comes to the actual values out Look, there? I, I have to tell you. The, the thing to understand here is they fooled themselves. They didn't fool us, they fooled themselves. And they were fooling us in the process, but they were not, uh, this is not something where there's a great conspiracy to pull the wool over our eyes. But, but part of the problem was, it seems to me as well, that they didn't have in the golf terms any skin in the game. I mean, they would do these complex things and then they would get passed along. And nobody had a personal investment in them. It was all electronic speeding, uh, trading at warp speed. Right. 
Well, what's happened over the last 30 years is that we've gone from a model in which banks make loans and hold them to investment banks underwrite bonds so that the savers' uh, money can go to the borrowers. And it went through Wall Street. And we're going to have to step back from that, this great securitization architecture that we had. It works. We're still going to have it. But there's got to be a mechanism for the people who underwrite it, that means the investment banks, to have more skin in the game so that they make good decisions. There were no grown-ups really in charge of the system. The grown-ups went away. The grown-ups used to be the banks. Is that a government problem, though? Is that, is that what we're, well, we're it, coming back it, to? It's sort of, I mean, if, Tom, if, if Tom's a bank and I go to get a mortgage from Tom, what happened was essentially you just sold those mortgages off to the right. Steves. And the, nobody really knew who held the risk. Should and that at some point, the taxpayer now will take that. I don't think Wall Street's ever going to be the same. I don't believe right. these high-flying days. I think when you put together the continuum of the NASDAQ bubble with the housing bubble, mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, the, what we're talking about is several uh, hundred-year floods in a period of less than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're going to be seeing from the future, and with a lot of political support, I think, out in the nation, are the kind of uh, shackles on Wall Street that it had begged not to have, but, but go ahead and be a politician and step forward and oppose that kind of regulate, regulatory oversight. And I think that's a losing game for most politicians. Let's go around the table if we can. Steve, let's